I'm determined that I will actually succeed in recording today. Okay. So what we want to talk today is we are going to go a little bit more in depth into lists. And I want you to be kind of awake today, if you can. Because what we are going to talk about is going to require conceptually a difficult part of this class. Okay? And uh, it is not difficult in the way loops are, it is difficult in the way functions are. So remember I told you functions would be difficult, and we are still learning. This is going to be difficult in a similar way. So um, let's start with simple, simple program, and then we are going to uh, get a little bit more fancy. I'm going to kind of take these agents here and move them to a new program. Okay. And we are going to um, we are going to first remember loops, and then I'm going to uh, talk a little bit more about interesting stuff involving lists. So let's remember what loops are going to do. So the, what loops do is they start from a certain value and they repeat a block of, they start with some condition, right? So you have while some condition and then you have some block of code, which is the simplest thing we can do is print hello. And it will repeat this block of code as many times as the condition is true. So generally the way we handle this is we start with some variable, let's say i, and then we have a condition if you want this loop to ever execute that is actually true in the beginning. So, for example, um, um, let's say i is less than 10. Of course, if you don't change i in the loop, the loop will always continue. So it's going to keep printing hello, right? So generally you count up, count down, and you basically um, repeat the loop as much as you can. So the thing that we were doing at the very end of the lecture was to look at loops that actually continue until some external condition becomes true. So one of the very common things you can do is you keep repeating, for example, you keep reading user input until the user tells you to stop. So, for example, I can use a Boolean, which is something that, you know, it takes a while for you to uh, get used to. And I can say finished is officially, originally is not uh, false because I want to execute it once. So, okay. So it says that initially finished is false. So while not finished means while finished is equal to true. While finished is equal to false, right? Not finished. While finished is equal to false, I'm going to execute this loop, right? So for example, I'm going to print hello, and then I'm going to set finished to true. So how many times is this loop going to execute? So once finished is false, not finished is true. So I'm going to execute the loop. I'm going to print hello. Then I'm going to set finished to true. Is not finished true? Not true is false. So the loop is going to end, and I'm going to stop. So do we understand this uh, negation? So not just negate something. So not true is false and not false is true. So this is the last thing I was doing before uh, we started rushing out. Okay. If this is kind of uh, confusing to you, because Booleans are kind of weird, we can do a different one. Let's say i is equal to 1, or let's say i is equal to 0, 
and while i is less than 1, okay, I'm going to print hello, and I'm going to increment i with 1. Or you can say while i is equal to 0, so I can set i to be something like 1. How many times does this execute? So once i is 0, you print it once, now you set it to 1. i is no longer 0, so you exit. So the Boolean is the same thing, it's just doing it with a true and false as opposed to this. Okay? So let's try to do the same thing, but this time I'm going to ask for input from you. I'm going to ask for So let's see how many agents we have. 14. Well, I can actually probably do even better. I can say enter an index between 0 and percent %d. Where the percent is going to be length of agents minus 1. So, and I'm going to also say or stop to n. So if command is equal to stop, I'm going to set i is equal to 1. Else, I'm going to do something else. Else, I'm going to take an index, which is the integer version, and then I'm going to print agents of i and maybe capitalize. Okay. So what does this do? Initially, i is equal to 0. <coughs> so I will enter the loop. And the first thing that I will do is I will ask for input, right? And it will tell me to enter an index between 0 and 13. Okay. So let's say I entered 1. Next thing I'm going to do is, I'm going to check if the command that you enter is stop or not. Is it? What is the value of command here? It's 1. So since it is not stop, I'm going to skip this one, and I'm going to execute this. Which turns out to be, convert the 1 to an integer so I can use it as an index, and print the value. Now that I am done with this, I'm going to go back here. Is i still 0? Yes, because I haven't actually changed it, right? So I'm going to ask the same thing again. So I'm going to enter a different index, let's say 4. Why is it that it's always sky? That is true. Thank you. I am actually printing the wrong thing. This is, this is a rule to remember that all bugs are stupid bugs. Okay, so let's do this again. So 1 is actually May, 4 is actually Colson. Okay. So this will go on because every time I get something other than stop, I execute this part and I never change the 1. So same thing is true, same thing is true. But then I'm going to enter stop. Will this work? No, because I actually check for capital stop. Well, that's something for you to do. All right. Now at this point, now I set i equals to 1. And because of that, my loop has stopped. Okay. So this is a loop where the ending condition really depended on something that you enter. 
right? It is an actually infinite loop, but it's not going to execute forever because every time it asks for an input from you, so you will probably get tired before the program does. So that's, that's what it has going for it. But it is, in fact, an infinite loop, right? Unless you enter stop. Um, so you will get more and more comfortable with such loops, but this is something kind of to remember. And if you can get comfortable with it, instead of a number, which you know is something much easier, you can actually use a Boolean. Once you get used to Booleans, is actually is the same thing. So it is exactly the same thing. I'm instead of zero and one using true and false. So um, the processing is the same. It's just that it is doing it with a boolean. So this is kind of what, where we are with loops. And on Tuesday, which is actually a Monday, but it's on a Tuesday, I'm going to do a little bit more about if statements. But we are going to write a lot more programs. But today, I want to talk a little bit more about lists. And we are going to do some interesting stuff. Okay, So this is the part of lecture I want you to be awake. You with me? Okay, so let's try waking up, waking up. No, no, you, look, you still look sleepy. Okay, so let's try to create some variables. So let's say that um, name is Sky. Um, I don't know, five is um, inhuman. I'm so happy TV is back. Let's call it a type. Um, and the uh, value is five, completely random. And let's say, let's have some scores. Okay. So these are all types of program, ty data types we have learned. So the data type for name and A type are string, right? It's easy. For value, it is integer. Um, how about my value? It's a tuple. What other data type we have? We have uh, num is 4.5, it's a float. And then the other one is true, right? So you have many different data types. But one of these data types is not like the others. Which one is the one that is different? Which one? The one that is really different is the one that is a list. Okay, and today we are going to learn why it is different. So let's try with a simple one. Value is equal to five. Okay. So value is a variable and it has a value, okay, it becomes kind of meta, that is five. Okay. So what does that mean is that your data your Computer has in storage some location for each of these variables, like a shelf, and it stores it somewhere. And it happens that value is in a shelf, and it's storing some value called five. Okay. So far, this is pretty stupid, but follow along with me. In the same way, I have a variable called name, and its name is Sky. And I'm not going to call her Daisy. So um, this is all very good. What happens if I create this, and I say name2 is equal to name? So I create a copy of the value, which is sky, and assign it to name2. So what I have done is I did name2 is equal to name. I created a new variable called name2. And I copied the value of this to this new area. Okay. 
So far, so good, right? So now let's create the scores. So now scores is a list, which is a complex data type. So it is likely stored in multiple shelves. Okay, so scores starts here, and it does contain what were the values? Two, three, and four? Two, three, and four. Okay? So the point is that scores itself is kind of this complex thing, and Python doesn't know if scores has three values or 500 values. If I say scores two is equal to scores, it is not clear whether you are supposed to create copies of 500 numbers, right? We are going to see how you can do that in one comment. So, so if I do this, something completely different happens. They have the same value, but the reason that they have the same value is not because I actually created a copy. I just created an alias for the same exact thing. Now I call it scores2. Okay. Now scores and scores2 are basically the same thing. It's just there are two different names for the same exact thing. This is like you have a house. This is my worst analogy, but you know, follow along with me. I had one about you know bathroom in a gas station. That's not doesn't work as well. Um, so <laughs> let's stick with the house. You have a house. You have a key, right? And you go and make an extra key, give it to somebody, but they open the same thing, right? So you did not create a new house, you just created a new key, okay? So the point is that since they point to the same thing, anytime I change it with respect to one variable, of course it is changed with respect to the other one too. So let's try that. So let's say I append a new value to scores. Now scores has 2, 3, 4, and 100. So ultimately what I have done is I added a new value, 100. So scores also have this value? That is true. So scores 2 also has this value. Because they point to the same thing. They are not two different lists. They are the same list with just two different names. Okay. So the only time this happens is with lists. As far as we know, we are going to see two more different data types where this is true. But for now, as far as we know, list is the only thing that has this property. And I can prove this to you. If I have my value 1, 2, my value 2 is my value. Okay. So if I change my value to be 3, 4, Because I already created a copy, so when I change this, the copy doesn't change, of course. This is actually kind of, it's actually very easy to see when this happens, because everything else except for lists is what we call a primitive variable. You can never change the inside of the variable, right? You can only change the full value of the variable. Whereas for lists, lists are a container, so you basically get a bag, and you can change the stuff in the bag as long as you have the handle for it, which is the name of the variable. Okay? So because of that, you have to be very, very careful when you're using lists, when you say A is equal to B, that is actually not making a copy, but it is, in fact, creating an alias. Okay? So why is this something we should care? Because if you take a list, pass it to a function. If you change the value in the function, the list will also change. So let's try to see with an example. Okay. And I'm going to do the same thing that we just did.
Anytime I write a while loop, my first instinct is to write the first thing that will stop the while loop, and then worry about everything else later, right? If uh, new value is equal to stop, I'm going to say finish is equal to true. Else, now, Otherwise, I'm going to take my values and append the new value. This sounds a lot like something you're doing for one of the homeworks. Um, and then I'm going to print my values. Okay. So this is very simple value. So um, let's uh, let's enter animals. So you have cat, dog, pig. I'm going to stop here. Right. Right. So I, every time I read a new value, I put it in a list. Okay. Now what I'm going to do is, I'm actually going to take these values, after I append them, I'm going to send it to a function. So I am going to um, arrange values, my values. <laughs> So let's try to figure out what this one does. So I keep reading a value. Every time I read a value, I put it in the list. Then I am going to send the um, list into a function. So let's write that down. So my values, let's say, as dog and cat. Okay. And then I have this function arrange values as my list. Okay. And then I actually call this function arrange values. So basically, I have a variable called my values, which is a list, right? And then I send it as an argument to this function, which then says that for this function, this my list should be set to this. Is my list now a copy of my uh, the, the, the list that I have? Is, do I create a copy of the list and send it to the function? Or do I actually send the address of the list to the function? So what does happen is that unless you really try hard, which we will see how, it always sends the address of the value. So as a result, what you're sending is an alias. So this is an alias to the list. So the function now knows the key to your list. Whatever it does to the list is actually be happening to your actual list because you have given the function the key, right? So if the function sorts your list, is it sorted in reality? Yeah, it should be. Okay. In fact, you can see the progress at each step. Okay, so I enter cat, which will then give me values and error. I enter cat, I enter dog, I enter artwork. Okay, it is continuously keeping the list sorted because every time I enter something, the list is sorted. 
So this would not have happened if in the list I created a copy of the uh, list and then changed the list in the function, then it would have been lost. In everything else that we have done, it actually was, the function was taking a value and creating a copy of the value. Let's, let's now look at the same thing, but in a different way. So for example, Um. Okay, so let's call this, of course, this is not a range values, let's say cap value. This is actually called, what's it called? New value. Okay. So you see how these two are completely different. So, new value is of data type. I read something from Roy in Boot, so new value is, it's a string, right? So, for example, if I were to execute this, the value that th th it takes is cat. So, I pass it to this, very, to this function. It takes the value, which is cat, and capitalizes it, right? And then when my function ends, does this value change? Will I have capitalized strings in the uh, function, in the list? No. Give me one second. Okay. So let's see why, and then I'll answer your question. Okay. So let's see why, because this is the most important part of passing by value versus by function. The second one was called dep cat value. Okay, so if I did have, for example, uh, my value is equal cat, and then cat, I guess it's called cap, cap value, my value. Okay, so now what happens is that this is the value cat. When I pass it to here, it creates a copy of the value. So it turns out this mystr is a totally new variable. It is a new variable, but it is not the same one as this one. So in fact, I have my value is cat. And when I pass here, my string now becomes cat. But these two are no longer the same variable. Right, because whenever it's a simple variable, you always create a copy. When you capitalize my variable, you capitalize this one. But nothing happens to this one because it is not a copy of it. So when this function ends and it returns, it doesn't return anything, so this is actually completely lost. So this value, the, the, whatever this function did, had no effect in this at all. If I wanted that function to have an effect in the variable, what should I have done? I should have returned the value, something like this. And I should have then done this, right? Because I need to take the value that it returns, assign the new value to my variable so that now it is capitalized. Okay, so, um, so ultimately, this is why they are completely different. Whereas when I'm sending a variable that is a list, it is actually sending an address. It is sending it by reference. 
So it is going to be fine. Okay, it's going to work the same way. Not only it is capitalizing, it is keeping it alphabetically sorted. Okay. Yes, question? Do you have a question? Syntax? Semantic. Okay. So, um, so are you following me? Okay, so now we are going to do an exercise. And this is confusing, but we are going to work on it, okay? So, let us try to do the following. Let's take the agents again from the overview. Okay. And I want you to write a function that capitalizes the names in its input list. So write a function capitalize all my list. That will capitalize everything inside this list called my list. Okay? So you need to write a loop to go through the elements one by one. You need to change the list. Then you need to write code to call that function. It should really be three lines, but I want you to experiment with this, then we will write this together, okay? Write a function to capitalize all the names in this list. Then write some code to call this function to capitalize the list agents. Okay? All right, give yourself a couple of minutes to do this. And then uh, we will we will solve it together. All right, I want to see some real effect.
Okay, so let me try and see how far you got. It's very important that you do this again without looking at the solution and then ask yourself why one version works, one doesn't work. You are going to write multiple versions. Okay, so I'm going to do the simple thing. I'm going to count from zero to the end of the list. So I'm going to have i is equal to zero. And while i is less than length of the list, okay, same thing we did last time. I am going to take my list of i and change it with its capitalized version. Okay. When I'm done, do I need to return something? Okay, so you can do it in one of two ways. You can return a list here and assign it back to itself, or you do nothing. Both will work because it turns out that my list is an alias, right, to the same thing as the list agents, right? When we call, so how do I call the function here? So I can call capitalize all agents, okay? So what's happening is that When I call capitalize all agents and my list and agents point to the same list. So whenever I change the contents of my list, I'm actually changing the contents of agents. So if I return from the function, okay, and get rid of my list, the agent's still pointing to the changed content. Or if I return the handle, my list, and then say agents should set to that one, it's okay because they are still pointing to the same thing. So both will work. But the general way we do it is exactly like this. Why is it not defined? Uh, this agents is before, yes. Okay. Thank you. I got it. Save it later. All right. Oh, you know what I did? Infinite loop, right? You all see it? Yes. All right. You see, I did as much as you do. Okay, you have to increment. This is why you should always write the condition and then write the other stuff. So one thing you can do, I think, you can restart like this. So this way, your infinite loop will end because a new function comes, okay? It would have also worked if you did it like this. If you actually returned my list and then if you said agents is equal to what this one returns, both will have the same thing because what you're returning is the alias. That alias already points to agents. If you set it again, you're not really changing anything. But uh, you really don't have to do this. It's a matter of which one you are comfortable with. So both will work. Now, Let's see a very different way of iterating through lists. So there is a super convenient way of going through items in a list. Okay? But if you don't use it correctly, you are going to make more mistakes. This is why we have now moved it so that we do while loops first. There is actually a very simple way of doing uh, loops. And to do that, let me do, okay, give me some animals. Cat, dog, pig. <coughs> I couldn't hear. Unicorn. Unicorn, yes, of course. Dolphin. Dolphin, thank you. Puddlefish. Puddlefish? I hope that these are real things and you're not making me right. <laughs> Let's just say it, fish. 
I feel uncomfortable. This could be something bad. All right. <laughs> um, um, all right, I'll put rabbit. I made peace with the rabbit. Okay, so if you want to go through every single element in the list, there is a very simple construct in uh, Python called a for loop, okay? It is not a for loop that you find in C++ or Java, okay? If you have done them, it is actually quite different. So don't be alarmed, but it is going to be a little different and you will see why. So what you can do is you can write a for loop that goes through every single element in a list. So something like for uh, A in animals, Friend A. Okay. So what's happening is very simple. It just takes the list animals and it goes through each element one by one and takes the value of the list, assigns it to variable A. And then I print value A. Okay. So I can just go through every single element and print it. So what does that mean is for A in animals, print A. So if I have cat, dog, and pig, so A is first going to have the value cat, right? Now, set A to cat is the value A pointing to the variable, to, to the uh, value cat, or is it a copy? It's a copy. Because the cat itself is a string, right? So the value itself is a string. Anything simple valued, I create a copy, right? So I take cat, make a copy, print that out. Then I take Next value, dog. Now A becomes dog. Take dog, make a copy, and print it out. Okay? And the same with pig. Take pig, make a copy, print it out, and move it outside of our house's uh, neighbor. But, you know, what can you do? Um, now, to, to show to you, here is what I'm going to do. I am going to say A is A dot capitalize, and then print A. Okay, so now the list, after I do this, does it have capitalized values or lowercase values? Lowercase, because I took the value, I made a copy of it, then capitalized the copy, and then printed it out. Right? So if I were to actually print animals, okay, the animals have not changed. But the value, the copy that I made into variable A, I capitalized. So while I'm going through the loop, they have changed. So you have to be very careful because what would happen if I had a list that also had lists of lists? So what if I had, instead of this, Values like this. So for A in values, print A. So, you know, each value that I put into A is now a list. So now A itself, is it a copy or an alias? Can't be both. It has to be one. Is A a copy or an alias? In the uh, in this part here, all right. Well, let's try. So I am going to append uh, one hundred to each one. All right. Will I see it same or different? So the value that I assign. The one two is a list, right? 
Because of that, A is now an alias to this list. So in fact, what I end up having is now I have So A becomes an alias to this list, and A becomes an alias to this list. Since it's an alias, when I change it, it should change. Okay. This is why it's kind of tricky to do things with a for loop, because you have to be very aware of what you're iterating over. Okay. And we are going to do a lot more for loops next Thursday. But since they are a little bit more tricky, we kind of stop at this point. Okay, so what have we learned so far? Let's, let's, let's track back. The most important thing is that when you said A is equal to B, right? So you have A is equal to three, B is equal to A. The data type of A is very important because if A has a simple value like string, integer, float, boolean, tuple, you create a copy of it, assign the copy. If it is a list, then you basically assign an alias that points to the same thing. It's the same object, they just have different names, different ways to get to the same thing. So as a result, whenever you change an alias, all the different variables that point to the same thing will also change. So because of that, the same thing applies to a function. Whenever you pass a variable to a function, if that variable has a simple value, you create a copy of that variable's value. If that variable has a list as a value, you simply pass an alias to that list. So this is kind of the basic thing that we are trying to get. So, and this goes through every single different ways of accessing things. So if you are iterating over a variable with a for loop, if that's a simple value, then you create a copy of it. If it's a list, then you create an alias for it. Yes? <coughs> okay, let's try to write down the rules again, right? So given A is equal to B, if A has a sim if I guess if B has a simple value, then B make a copy of its value and assign to A. If B is a list, from now on we are going to say a container because we will see other containers, not just lists. So any container, but lists are the only containers we know, then A is a, an alias to B. They point to the same object. So the same thing is true for a function. So if variable B is passed as an argument to a function, if B has a simple value, then we make a copy of its value. Otherwise, we create an alias to the same object, okay? So remember, simple values are integer, float, string, boolean, and tuple and containers are lists. But eventually we will learn things like sets and dictionaries as well. But we don't know what they are currently. Okay. So now we are going to do some simple stuff. But for each one, you have to remember which ones actually return a new list, which ones actually um, create, which ones are an alias. Okay. So, were you able to follow me so far? Okay. So let me see if I have another exercise that we can do. I think we have done that one. So I'm going to skip range for now, but I'm going to start doing a few other things. Okay.
So we are going to see them simple, but they become very complicated when we have list of lists. So let's look at simple variables, simple lists that have simple values themselves, right? So it goes through the argument that applies to the lists and to the elements of the lists recursively, okay? Don't worry about if that, that's not meaningful to you, okay? So x is a list. I can do the same stuff that I can do to strings, also to lists. What are the things that I can do to strings? That the first things we learned that you can take two strings and you can concatenate them, right? So I can take two strings and I concatenate by plus. So I can do the same thing. I can take two lists and concatenate them. So the question is, does this return a new list or does it actually uh, uh, point to the same list? So, well, you can try and see. So I have x, y, and z. Okay, so do I, when I change x, will it change z? Okay, so let's try. X. So x is this, y is this, and z is this. So the first thing we learn is that concatenation creates a new list. Yay! So there is no aliasing, it's a totally new list. Actually, it's not true, but you know, we'll start with that one. Okay. The second one we learned after concatenation, we learned what was the one where you multiply you multiply a string to repeat it, it's called replication. So you can do the same thing by function that uh, takes a list and multiplies it four times. Very convenient. Okay. And it turns out that that is also a copy. So W is now a totally new unseparated unsep list from uh, Y because if I change Y, it does not have an effect on W. So that is nice. So what we have learned is that replication creates a new list as well. If you really want to create a new list that is an identical copy of an existing list, you can do it in a few ways. So the easiest way you have is you can create SAK, a list of the same thing. So list of x is actually a copy of x. Okay. So x and k have the same copy, but they are have the same values, but they are actually different copies. So if I were to let's say change x, it does not change k. Okay. So copy, we will call it shallow copy. Okay. Creates a shallow copy. The list. So which is so this one is x plus y. This is x <coughs> times uh, ten. This is list of x. Okay. So another thing that you can do, which is actually extremely convenient, is you can take a list and you can create a copy of not the whole list but a part of the list. Okay. This is where now you are going to see the thing that magically solved the, uh, the reverse thing. And, uh, and you know, you wrote it because you all understood what it did, right? You know, you had a slash slash negative one, right? Do you remember this? Remember in the homework where we had the reverse of the value? So let's see. Let's restart here. So if I had x1, 2, 3, you know, if I do slash slash negative 1, I think that works. This is what happens. In fact, that's what you were doing because you had a uh, string that had uh, this and then you were applying this negative 1, right? How many of you did this? Come on. There we go. Okay. So now we come to the most important part of CS1. Okay. This is what I call programming by Googling. 
Uh, it is a real thing, actually, and it is a perfectly fine thing because you will be doing that. But you will only do that after you learn what you're doing. Yes? No. I think this was Google. No, I didn't do slicing at all. This is the first time you're talking about slicing. But, but okay, so this is an important important uh, you know public announcement okay so very often when you're trying to program you don't know how to do something you will just google it right and then stack overflow will give you some simple recipe of random things and like libraries you will modules you've never heard of or one line it will solve your problem right okay that is perfectly fine way to program okay Except that's not a good way to learn. Once you know what you're doing, that's fine. Do it. You found a short way to do it. But ask yourself, do I know why that works? If you know why that works, if you can replicate it, that's fine. If not, I mean, I assume that you are learning new things in this class. Then you should not be doing random things. You should be trying to figure out what we are trying to teach you to do, right? Because that magic formula may not work in C++. Or in Java, so okay. Um, my my philosophy is never to put anything in my program that I don't know what it does or why it works, unless I'm in a horrible deadline and you know uh, I have other things to do. Okay, um, and and in the long term that doesn't help you solve homework uh, exam problems. That's that's why I put that exam problem there. All right. Anyway. So what you can do is, given a list, like x, so what are the valid indices of x? The first one is 0, 1, and 2, right? You can take the indices and you can create a slice of it as a new list. So generally, for example, you can say start at index 0, go up to index 1, but not including index 1. Find all the values in the list, create a new list containing only those values. And this is actually a copy. Slicing itself creates a copy. It is not the same, it doesn't point to the same value. Okay, so you can have any slice. And what happens if I put a huge slice? <coughs> Is there an index 5? No. It's not mine, right? Um, but the nice thing about slicing is that it never gives you an error. It is like one of the nicest functions available. So if you want to write a piece of code that will never fail, you can use that one. So for each slice, you have a beginning point and an end point. Okay? What if you don't care where it starts from the very beginning, so you don't actually have to write 0? Up to a certain point, you can also do that. So you can say, start from the very beginning and go up to 2. Or you can say, start from 1, go up to the end. Okay. So in the slicing, if you give some value, beginning or end, it will go from that index up to the index you gave. If you gave no index, then it will start from the very beginning or to the very end, right? So um, it goes something like this, right? So you have a slice. So this is the beginning index. This is the ending index. Okay. There's an optional thing we will get to. So if this is missing, then it starts from the very beginning. If this is missing, it goes all the way to the end. And in fact, you can start from the back and go forward. Or you can, so you can use any valid index. So let's try. But this time I will try to put a bigger, uh, okay. So let's try the agents here. Okay, so if I find 
agents from 1 to 4, how many values do I expect? How many values in this list? So I will have agents of 1, agents of 2, and agents of 3, but not 4, right? It is up to 4, not including 4. Okay? It's something you have to get used to. Because everything is 0 indexed, it always goes to minus 1. Yes? So when you have 1 in the set, you mean You mean like this? All the way to the end, from one up to end. Why not? Because, oh, even think about this. When the length of the list is 14, right? But there is no actual index 14, right? So, like, if I had this, so if I had agents from zero to length of agents, right? This would be an error if it actually went to the agents, right? If it went to 14, but it will not. It will just go to up to 13, right? It is just because of zero index. It always goes up to that level. It is just a convenience thing if you get used to it. So you can actually also do, let's see. So you can also do a slice, but you can count by twos. So instead of going one each element, you can go by every other element, so you can count by two. You can also count negatively. This is the one I'm not great at, but let's try. So let's start from negative one up to negative eight. Which one is negative one? Negative one is fury, right? Now you're starting from the end of the list going forward. So you have minus 1, minus 2, minus 3, minus 4, minus 5, minus 6, minus 7. That's it, right? It's going to stop that Morse. But what will happen if I do this? Right, it didn't, I didn't tell it to go backwards. I, did it, I told it to go forward. So there is no way to count forward from ne negative 1 to negative 8, right? But remember, this is the nicest thing in the world. So it doesn't give you an error, but just gives you nothing. I actually have to tell it to count negatively, right? I have to tell it to count negative 1. So this is exactly what you were doing when you were reversing the string, because when you're reversing the string, you're telling the string, like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, that you want to slice it, but count it negatively. So when you're counting negatively, you start from the end, go towards the beginning, and that's what you get. Now, like you saw, in fact, you can slice strings in the same way you slice lists. But the big difference is that, you know, when you slice a list, you get a list. When you slice a string, you get a string. But the same thing still holds that slicing will actually create a shallow copy. So you have to be very com very comfortable and very aware of what each function does when it creates a shallow copy and when it when it creates an alias. Okay, and I will tell you why I call it a shallow copy, but we will do it the next time. I actually still did not get to doing my uh, movies that were filmed in New York, so we will do that the next time. And we will actually write a lot of programs and then um, and then we will continue on. Okay.